Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Once again, Happy New Year. Now, on occasion, when you turn on the television, if you're brave enough to watch the news, you might hear a story or two like this. A 25-year-old man ditched his tracking device and fled in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, from a courtroom upon learning that the jury had quickly reached a verdict in his case. Assuming he would be found guilty, he fled. The suspect is still at large. And that wouldn't surprise you to hear a news story like well, maybe this one. A 19-year-old woman facing multiple charges fled from a crisp county Georgia courtroom after her bond was revoked. The suspect is still at large. Or maybe this one. A 20-year-old man and 17-year-old woman accused of selling narcotics in White Lake Township, Michigan, fled into a nearby wooded area after local officers pulled the vehicle over for speeding. Suspects are still at large. These stories, all true, are familiar to our hearing. We've heard stories like this before where suspects flee from authorities, which got me to thinking, why do suspects flee? I suppose the answer is simple. It's because they don't want to face the consequences of their actions. Now, these consequences they might be actual, but they might also be perceived, potential, But either way, they flee because they're afraid. In their mind, there's more hope in running than there is standing up for what they've done. Now, if you're a good Lutheran, at this point you're asking this question. Pastor, what does any of this have to do with Advent? What does any of this have to do with Palm Sunday... You should be asking this question, what does any of this have to do with Jesus? For the last couple of sermons, I've pointed out in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, these words. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. It's amazing to me that Jesus, instead of fleeing from Jerusalem, Jesus faithfully went toward it. Jesus faithfully went toward Jerusalem for you and for me. Put yourself in Jesus' sandals for just a moment. Jesus, 100% God, and also 100% man knew, being omniscient, that as he entered into Jerusalem, he would be nailed to a tree and he would die on a cross. And yet, Jesus did not flee from Jerusalem. Jesus steadily went toward Jerusalem nonstop. entering into Jerusalem, amazingly, Jesus came to earth. Think of that. Jesus was a resident of heaven. Jesus was in heaven, the place that you and I long to be. Jesus was in heaven, and God, his Father, looked across the heavens towards his Son and said, Son, it's time to go. It's time to leave this place and go to earth. Now, earth, it's nice, but I wouldn't leave heaven for it. And Jesus left heaven, and then listen to this. Not only did he leave heaven, but he came to earth in the form of a baby to be born of a virgin in a town called Bethlehem. 
He was placed in a manger, in a smelly stable, to be the son of a simple, sinful carpenter. If we were Jesus, wouldn't you and I have fled this earth, but not Jesus? Jesus came to this earth obediently. So, kind of a trick question that I want to pose to you today. Uh, Curious as to how you would answer this. Jesus, we know, as mentioned earlier, was omniscient. He knew all things. He's also omnipotent, meaning that he's all-powerful. Desires, and so I ask you this. Could Jesus have run? Could Jesus have fled? Could Jesus have fled this earth? Could Jesus have fled and run from the cross? I believe the answer is no. Even though he was omnipotent, I believe the answer is no because Jesus was and is 100% obedient and dedicated to the will of his Father. And for that reason, Jesus could not have fled. It would have been impossible for him to run. Why? Look at what we've done here. Jesus left heaven and walked the road to Jerusalem because the work his father had set before him to do was ahead. And that's why Jesus came. And so the main point that I want you to see in this first half of this sermon is this. Jesus traveled toward our punishment rather than fleeing from it. Now, we should stop right there. We could move on with our worship service, get to communion a little bit early, probably get home a little sooner. But as I pondered that, I pondered the fact that he traveled toward our punishment instead of fleeing from it, I continually asked this week that question, why? And we've already discussed that it was because of his perfect obedience to God. But then that led me to the question, what was the work that God sent Jesus to do, which he desired to be obedient to? And that led me to John 6. And so I, we say this every Sunday, but, but I really mean it this Sunday, and I'll explain why in just a few moments. I, I'd like for you to open your Bibles, please, to John 6. Again, I know, we say this every Sunday, turn your Bibles to the... But in a few minutes, you're going to go, ah, I see exactly why he asked us to do that. So please open your Bibles to John chapter 6. It's on page 891 in your text. Now, we're going to begin looking at verse 22, but I need to set up verses 22 through 40. And since your Bibles are open, you can actually follow along a little bit. Jesus has just fed the 5,000 men, women, and children. And so after this miracle, uh, Jesus instructs the disciples to go on ahead of him. They hop into the boat. They head across the water toward Capernaum. Jesus is on the side of the mountain spending one-on-one quality time with his dad. In the middle of the night, Jesus gets up and goes out to the disciples on the water. He's walking on the water. He gets into the boat. The boat gets to the other side to Capernaum, and now the sun starts to come up. Now it's morning. Now the people who had just eaten of this feast the night before, they wake up and surprise, surprise, they're hungry. And they come out of their doors and they go, I am starving. Where is that guy, Jesus? And so they begin to look. 
Rumor has it he's made his way to Capernaum, and so that's where the crowd goes. Start asking Jesus questions when they find him, and the, the primary emphasis of their questions is this. Jesus is supposed to do do something. Tell us what we're supposed to do. Here's how Jesus answers that in verse 29. You can see it in your Bibles or on the screen. Jesus answers the questions with these words. This is the work of God. That's the question. What was the work that God sent Jesus to do? This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. To-do list has one box and they're ready to check it. Okay, Jesus, let me make sure I've got this straight. Uh, there's one thing that we have to do, believe in you, right? But, but then, then they say this. They say, we are ready to believe in you. I tell you what, Jesus, do one more sign. Do one more miracle. You do one more sign. You do one more miracle. And we will believe in you. And might we suggest bread? Because <laughs> we're still hungry. And it's that situation that sets up now John chapter 6, verses 35 through 40. Now, we're only going to put the first half of that text up on the screen because there are gremlins afoot today. I, we've done this. We've done this over and over today. The slides are on my computer. We've thumb-drived them to the computer in the sound booth, and they just won't transfer no matter how hard we've tried. So this will be the last slide that you're about to see. And oh, the next slides that I had for you, they were ever made at Holy Cross. But now we're going to have to do this interesting thing. We're going to have to take our eyes off of the screen, and we're actually going to have to look at the Word of God. We'll, we'll see how it goes. And so look at what, how Jesus responds to their request for bread. Jesus says, I am the bread. You got it. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you says to the crowd. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Now, watching in your scriptures at verse 38, these next few verses, they are the key. Please be alert, be awake, be attentive. These are the verses that I want you to see. Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven... Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. That I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus just describes three reasons that he was sent to this earth. Jesus just describes to the people the work that God has sent him to do, and here they are, number one, is to be seen by Jesus to be seen by those who do not believe so that they might believe. Which is also point number two. God sent Jesus so that you and I, the rest of the world, would believe in him as the son of God. 
that his death on the cross is a replacement for you and for me. His death is our death, and that his resurrection is our resurrection, which leads us to the third point. And finally, to be resurrected on the last day. And so those first two points is why Jesus came, we celebrate at Advent, and the last point is why he come again to raise you and I from the grave. Properly set up the gospel, the sermon can now begin. Again, amazing to me that Jesus would enter into Jerusalem and not flee from it. Why would he do that? For you. You matter that much to him that as he mounted the colt, as he sat upon the donkey, He did that with you on his mind. He did that for you and obediently entered Jerusalem. He could die for you and for me. Church, I don't know what you do while we sing hymns. I, I suppose you, you sing the notes. I, 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 I suppose you follow along with the tune. But what was intended to be a slide, we will now actually reach in the pew and grab a hymnal. It's the maroon book in the pew in front of you. And would you please open your hymnal? I don't know what you do when we sing our hymns. I don't know where your mind is at. Here's what some people do, I imagine. They worship the Lord, they sing the tune, and they really pay attention to the words that they're singing. That might sound foreign to some of you, but I imagine that's what some people do. What were you doing while we sang verse 5? Let's look at verse 5 together. O come, thou key of David, come. What is the purpose of a key? To open that which is locked. And here we say, O come, thou key of David. Jesus, you are the key that unlocks. Unlocks what? And open wide our heavenly home. Make safe, we pray. Make safe, we request. Make safe the way that leads on high. And close the path to misery. Verse 5 is a fog. Have you ever seen fog in a video where it opens up just before you arrive but immediately closes behind you? That's verse 5. That's Jesus for you and for me. Jesus is the one lane superhighway that delivers us to eternal life in heaven with God our Father. And as He delivers us there path of misery that we live here on this earth is closed behind. And that is why he came and why he comes again. And so I've given Ara the next few minutes off. Let's sing verse 5 again. A cappella, paying attention to what we sing. O come, thou key of David, come. 
and open wide our heavenly home. Make safe the way that leads on high, and close the path to mid.